Well, good evening, everybody. Good so evening. thank you very much for your wait and your patience. You know, we finally have here, you know, our guest of honor. Uh, my name is Franz Tanai. I'm a partner of Castles Brock and Blackwell and the Business Law Group and the Mining Group of Castles Brock. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, I want to welcome you all. And uh, I want to welcome Ken Franco from the CCA and Maria Corina Machado. Uh, we're thrilled to host this event on behalf of the CCA. Um, as a Venezuelan Canadian, uh, I'm very, very happy that you're here. And uh, Maria Corina is an inspiring leader. And I'm going to turn it over to Ken and to Maria Corina to give uh, start the formal part of the meeting. Great. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, I see that track record lately of guests coming and having some mechanical problems with their airplanes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the good news is we also have very loyal stakeholders who stay to whatever time it is to listen to our speakers and to attend our programs. So thank you very much for your patience. Of course, the first thank you goes to Castles Brock. This is all possible because And to France, who steadfastly stayed with this event through the various ups and downs of confirmation and almost confirmations, and, and of course, uh, Maria Corina and her very, very, very able assistant, Emiliana, who's so dedicated that she stayed behind waiting for her lost luggage and told us to go ahead <laughs> without her. And we took that to heart, and we did. Um, a couple of things I want to say um, is, we are having another event. Those are, those, most of you know a lot about the Canadian Council for the Americas, but those who don't, our next event after this one is only a few days away. It's May 20th. It'll be a discussion of the upcoming presidential elections in Colombia. The elections are on May 25th, and our program will be May 20th, only five days ahead of time. And the guest speaker will be Dario Vargas, who is, uh, speaks to and, and is a whisper into the ears of probably every major politician in Colombia, as well as probably every CEO in Colombia. I may be overestimating that a little bit, but um, he uh, he's a, brings a very unique perspective. He's worked on various political campaigns and has worked in various presidential administrations in addition to the private sector. So he knows how to talk to the private sector people about what's going on in government, and he knows how to talk to the government people about what they should be thinking about with respect to private sector. Uh, so that's the first little bit of announcement. Secondly, this is an on-the-record discussion, uh, and so uh, for all that that means, uh, what will happen is uh, Maria Corina will give a discussion for 15, 20 minutes, actually as long as people want to stay, but we'll do, and then we'll sit down and then I will ask some questions and, and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, of course, we understand that this is Canada, so discourse will be civil. Uh, and, uh, or else, uh, and, uh, and Maria Corina will take all questions. It's just a question of, of, of please maintain Canadian decorum. Uh, in this event, we know that there, there are a lot of um, emotions on this event. I should also add that we did extend an invitation to the, the Venezuelan Embassy oh, yeah. in Ottawa to, uh, to come and, and make comments, and they haven't responded to that, but we are nonpartisan, and we present, we have no problem presenting all sides of this issue. Um, they have not taken us up on that offer as of yet, but it is something that we have done, and we will continue to keep open. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Maria Corina. Thank you very much. Over 43 people have died. So far this year, it's almost 5,000 Venezuelans who have died have been killed. And um, we all know the records, the official records from the uh, National Prosecutor's Office. 96% of all those killings are uninvestigated, unsolved. And that's why one of the reasons why Venezuela is today in our current situation. Well, I'm very grateful to all of you. I'm especially grateful to Ken Frankel and the Canadian Consul of Americas and to all Venezuelans around the world that are today our best ambassadors and that give us even more hope about uh, the 
future of our country will live soon. A future in which many families that have been divided and separated will have the opportunity to come back together. Whilst you are well aware, I'm a member of the parliament, even though today I'm not allowed to enter the buildings of um, the National Assembly. Last week, we arrived to the first month after I was uh, accused of treason to our country because I dared to speak out, such as I'm doing right now, at the Organization of American States. Speaking on behalf of the people, speaking on behalf of the young students, of their mothers, of their parents, of their grandparents, of the children they will have someday. In a country in which Venezuelans believe today or feel today that there is no future whatsoever. Anyone that has a basic, basic knowledge of our country is shocked, appalled of what our current situation, our current state. When we think of how much and how deep and how wide we have been blessed in terms of the natural beauties, climate, biodiversity, geographic location, in terms of the resources in our soil, the richness, the diversity, and of course certainly the warmth of our people. We things that we certainly share with you guys, not, not precisely um, uh, with, the, with the Canadians, I mean not precisely the cli climate, no. but I would say <laughs> I would say all those other resources and the kindness and the kindness of our people. And then you see how people around the world are thrilled to come to this country, to this good, great country, while young people in Venezuela, heartbroken, are living our own country, their country. So it's it's uh, it's time to 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 analyze and, and to and also to react. Um, this, the, the the reasons are obvious. Venezuela is living an economic disaster. You all know it very well. I will mention only certain, because it's on the record, um, um, facts, but you know them very well. Having the highest inflation rate in the world, the official, the official inflation rate this month, it's almost 70%. It's gonna be probably well about 100 at the end of the year especially in, in, in food and basic goods, which are the ones that, that need the most, that, that, that consume the most, the, the poorest Venezuelans. Scarcity index of 30%, not even a country in the middle of a war, of a war, a long period of war, would, would reach this state. Venezuelan mothers, women, have to spend six, eight, ten hours a day in long lines to buy Simply the food their children need. Milk, flour, rice, chicken. When we see wages today, minimum wage, which is in the public sector almost the unique wage, it's roughly around $64 a month. In order to feed a family, you would need four and a half minimum wages. And, uh, and then, when you see the capacity of production of our economy, 70% of what we eat today comes from imports. And regarding exports, around 97% are oil uh, sources. Everything else, everything else that we use to export has been destroyed. And regarding our main production sector, we all know it's oil. Well, I'm going to refer to official uh, numbers uh, from the International uh, Energy Agency. Uh, we, uh, 15 years ago, were roughly around 3.3, 3.4 million barrels a day. Today, well, choose the figure. Nobody knows, but it's roughly a million less, a million barrels a day, less. The social tragedy, I would need the whole evening to describe it, but I I have to refer to an experience I had last week. I was in Estado Portuguesa, Guanare is a city. Its main hospital is called Dr. Miguel Ora, and I was 
in a couple of rallies, good rallies with the students and their moms. And I was stopped in the street by a couple of doctors, a group of doctors. One of them is an old doctor who was the founder of the Unidad Neonatal, where newborn babies that have problems are attended. And he stopped me crying. And he said, I did yesterday what I never thought I would. I resigned. 13 new newborn babies died in my hands because of lack of medicines, because equipment wasn't working. I cannot keep on seeing this. And also because he, he has been well known for the director of the hospital, Riley quitted this morning, that um, there was a well known bacteria that is true. Out throughout mm. the hospital. And they didn't Absolutely, that is true. And they had announced it uh, a month before. Um, so what I'm, what I'm, what I, this broke my heart. I mean, you know, you can go through figures and numbers, but these are babies, and certainly, and, and this morning, the mothers of these babies were were marching down the streets in in Wanare, accompanied by, by by other mothers. We weren't there physically, but we were with we them. Were there. We were there. So, and when you add, uh, and. In addition to this, um, the, the violence factor uh, that has turned to be into a policy of state. It's a state policy. Uh, every 21 minutes, uh, a Venezuelan citizen is killed, mainly young and poor men, young men. And as I said, 96% of all these crimes are not even investigated. So one wonders. Is it this disaster the consequence of incompetence and corruption only? Certainly, we have the most corrupt government in our history, but it goes beyond incompetence and corruption. This time that we understand that this is a deliberate model that has been put in place along these years. In order to have total control of a society, you need to eradicate every element of it that creates autonomy, that gives you the strength to, to, to defend yourself, to choose your future, to decide. And that's why we've seen an attack, systematic attack, against unions, universities, guilds, political parties, the private sector, and even the churches, even the churches. So it's, it's important that we understand that this is not only a consequence of, it, of their incompetence and corruption. When you see what they have done to the, to the food and agricultural sector, Almost five million hectares, hectares, that's, that's correct, hectares have been expropriadas, expropriated. Oh, Excuse me? Acres. That's, that's the correct uh, word? So, so, so well, but you know what I mean. Expropriadas mean taken away by the government and not paid. And, and you know, I have had, I have had several uh, conversations with with the hardworking Venezuelans who used to have small, middle, or big farms. And they come to me and they tell me, how come they took mine if mine was the most productive one? I had invested, we have the uh, developed technology, we were above average in terms of producing milk or meat. And I said, precisely because of that. Precisely because of that. And when you see that 90% of all the farms and all the land that was taken away today is not producing, it's not productive. That's why we are importing 70% of what we eat. And it's not only big farms. When you see what they have done to the coffee sector, it used to be 75,000 families, mainly poor families, that dedicated their lives to this uh, activity that used to produce, and please hear me those that come from Colombia, the best coffee in the world. <laughs> and, and it was for 200 years. Today, 
we're not exporting Venezuelan coffee anymore, we're importing it at a much high price from Nicaragua that it is paid to local producers. So no wonder, no wonder why social unrest has been growing in the last years in Venezuela. Only last year we had over 5,000 protests in the streets, mainly regarding labor issues or um, violence, security, home, and so on. But the government decided and was able to last year to maintain them isolated, control, and of course, through two strategies, try to uh, extinguish these protest uh, um, um, process in, in, in the country. One, through the judiciary system, criminalizing protests. And this is something that is not new. We've seen that. And we've seen as union leaders are persecuted, put in, in jail, and so on. Second, of course, by extinguishing the freedom of speech and the media. And, and you are quite aware of what it means to be a journalist today in Venezuela. I usually say that true journalists today and the exercise of, of journalism is an act of heroism. And, uh, and there are many that are true heroes. There are many that have decided to shut down. And um, in order to learn what's going on in Venezuela, we have to rely on international media or the social media. And uh, regarding the judiciary system, I, I would like to mention a couple of things. One, because that has a lot to do with, with how business has been done today in Venezuela. Uh, in, in 1999, there were roughly 2,000 uh, judges in, in Venezuela, in all courts. Ten years later, 2009, you know how many of those 2,000 judges were still, the, I mean, the same people in their charges, in their places? Less than 20. So every single judge that was not absolutely loyal, beyond doubt, was thrown out and replaced. And today, 77% of all judges are not permanent judges. They are temporary judges. And do you know when, what, what they, in whom they think every time they have to make a political decision? Maria Lourdes Hafiuni, who is still in jail. It's home jail. But she was sent to Yale by Hugo Chavez in a national TV broadcast. So every time a Venezuelan judge has to make a tough decision, believe me, she comes to their minds. So if this is a deliberate process, if this is an attack that is not going to be reversed, um, reverse is the word used? Yeah. Uh, reversed? Mm -hmm. Not only because the government doesn't want, it's because they can't. Venezuelan regime today follows orders from the Cuban regime and of course has internal factions that are under tense confrontation. So if all this process is reversed, do you imagine this, go this government giving back the TV concessions to RCTV and all the radio stations around the country, or say no, we, we made a mistake. We we don't want to 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 own all the steel factories, cement factories, and uh, we will give them back so that private uh, and free enterprise will grow in the country. Do you imagine this system saying from now on we will have independent judges and the bills won't be wrote down in Miraflores? Do you think this possibly happened? And the reason, and, and the conclusion is, is clear. Policies will not change. So we need to change the regime if we want to live in freedom and peace. And that's exactly what our young students realized at the beginning of this year. From abroad, Venezuela was seen as a society that was divided, terrified, in despair. Nobody thought it was possible that we would awake. Look where we are. Our young students, cold, our conscience and our hearts, our young students talked about principles. 
about dignity, human dignity and national dignity, sovereignty. They talked also about love for their country and their right to have a future, to conquer their future. And they went out and their mothers followed and parents and grandparents. And uh, what we saw was a reaction of a regime that it's clear that has lost the support and trust of the whole society. And they followed orders also this time. And they thought that with huge repression, they will extinguish this, this desire to fight. And what we've seen in the last days, not only the cruel crimes that have been taking place in the last weeks, cases of torture. Um, I'm sure you're all aware and have, um, have read the, the report of Human Rights Watch. But, but if you don't, I, I urge you, please, to do it. Um, because it's clear here the intention, the cruelty, the systematic and massive violations of human rights, and the fact that this regime has crossed a red line. So what we're facing is, in front of us, the path to freedom. It's not easy. It's full of, of challenges. But as we have demonstrated in the past, when the Venezuelan people decide to live in freedom and peace, nobody will stop us. And that's what our young students have shown. Yes. this will sound hard to, to understand at this time because in the last 48 hours we living we are living very tough very tough um, actions uh, on Friday you saw uh, the, the press conference and, and statements of the interior minister in which people from every single sector were accused of, of conspiring and most of those that were named are currently uh, persecuted or detained. Uh, we saw yesterday, uh, yesterday, no, this morning, forgive me, I mean, it's, it's intense. Um, this morning what happened with um, Leopoldo Lopez uh, audience that, that, that should hearing that should have taken place today and the fact that he is being treated worse than a prisoner of war, totally isolated in a military jail. Um, the way um, this morning police and the military act in raids against peaceful students in tents in camps throughout this, the country, mostly in Caracas, over 900 officials, military and civil, attacked them and took them in buses and uh, some of them are in military facilities, some of them are in police facilities. And, and they're accused of terrorism. They're accused of destabilizing the country. But let me tell you, they are determined to fight and they will not be shut down. So there are many reasons to be full of hope at this time. Please realize how much we have achieved where we were in January where we are today Venezuela is another nation the story the history of Venezuela has already changed there is a huge desire to produce to invest to create and that will take place once we carry out this transition to democracy, which is our next stage, our next step. And in that sense, we need of every single one of you, not only Venezuelans abroad, but <coughs> Democrats, that realize that it's Venezuelan tragedy goes beyond our borders. The, the um, model has expanded to some other countries, but also international crime and businesses has come 
abroad and infiltrated in our institutions, making it a very complex and, and danger uh, system for Venezuelans without doubt, but also for the whole region. So this is an historic moment. Never have we been so close to move along a democratic transition in the last 15 years. And we will not fail our, our duty with history and with future generations. Thank you very much. question I would well, I have many, but the, the first question is, what's the way forward now? There is a MESA um, dialogue going on with the government. Uh, some people have been supportive. You've been a bit critical of it um, for various reasons, which I hope you will explain. Um, and, and as a corollary to that, uh, the, the difference of opinion show that there's a deep division within the opposition. And if so, about what basic issues? And if not, um, why not? So much time to <laughs> <laughs> They've already eaten. They have plenty of time. <laughs> but I haven't. <laughs> no, you have it, that's right. No, no, that's no, right. Okay. Look, I first have to say that to, to be effective towards a regime that is so complex, because many realize at the beginning its uh, authoritarian nature, but the way it has been hiding behind this uh, pseudo democratic facade uh, made it even harder to, uh, to fight than traditional dictatorships, conventional dictatorships. Because they are authoritarian, but they disguise as democracies. So that creates certainly um, doubts on how to be more effective fighting against it. I think we've learned so much in these years. And we have created uh, a platform in which uh, people who have very different backgrounds and ideas have understood that we need to be together in order to have more strength. And that's the myth I know that. It's plural, and we have different opinions, but we have the same purpose, which is a democratic, productive, and free Venezuela. Certainly, at this moment, there are differences regarding dialogue. Not because we don't share the, the, the notion that dialogue is, is, is necessary and, and, and an essence of a democratic system. It's how to approach it and when. And that was the difference that we had. We believed that we should have put certain conditions before starting the dialogue in order to achieve faster and more results because we realize this is not the first time the government calls for a dialogue in these 15 years. They have done it several times. And, we, and the times we have um, accepted and trusted, once those agreements are settled, then they betray the word. So this time we said, OK, well, first, we need proofs that it's not going to happen again. And some of those proofs was you have to release the political prisoners, the students, Leopoldo Lopez, and we want to have uh, a third party that is truly trustful for all of us. And we insisted that UNISUR had a track record that certainly gave us profound doubts. Uh, and that, that was the basic difference. And, and what we said is, uh, what, what we cannot stop is protests in the streets, even if dialogue starts. So what we say is, well, some, part, some group is going to participate in dialogue. We are going to dedicate to support the protests in the streets. And that's exactly what we have done. And, and what we will keep on doing. So I believe that it, it is in the interest of the government and the Cuban regime to divide the position, and they will not accept it because they will not uh, achieve it uh, because we are not only staying together, but we are increasing unity because it's time that student movements and other organizations that have aroused in these months come together in the same platform. 
Thank you. I, just, to, just to follow up to that question, um, a bit, and you, thank you for highlighting the different positions vis-a-vis -vis the discussions and why I felt that. Just speak up a little bit? Yeah, I just said I, just, I appreciated that her illumination as to where she thought the fault lines were, at least going into the discussions. The follow-up question I have for that is, as you know, one of the, considered one of the moderate leaders in the opposition, Mr. Capriles, has said recently, very pointedly, we, I don't support pushing the government out. I support completely constitutional means for this government leaving, which would be allowing it to go to the first constitutionally mandated uh, ability to change the regime, which would be through a recall referendum next year. When he makes that pointed point, say, well, I'm not for extra constitutional measures, is he, who is he addressing? Is he talking to the public, the government, is he also talking to people in the opposition who might be you know, considered to be, quote, more hard line about what the exit strategy is for this government? Well, I certainly don't know, but he certainly not talking about me. Right. Because <laughs> I, I would say that I totally agree with the first half part. And, and we have insisted clearly, clearly, and firmly. We believe we are in Venezuela today, there's no democracy. It's not, there's no deficit of democratic practices. There's no democracy whatsoever in Venezuela, and things should be called by their names. Today, there is a dictatorial regime, a dicta dictatorship. And I know it's hard to call things such as this at this point. People would prefer not to do that. But if you don't understand the nature of the system you're facing, we are not going to be effective in order to make the transition take place. And uh, I, I would, please give me one minute to, to, to minute make my you. point. Because how would you call a regime that eliminates all separation of power, all independence of power, that uh, does not respect the rule of law whatsoever, that uh, understates to a point that, I ask you if you think you can talk about uh, uh, a truly genuine, um, National Assembly. Is there is there a parliament in Venezuela today, or or don't you think that as well as those judges thinking Maria Lourdes Afuni when they make a decision, my colleagues have someone in mind when they take up their right to speak. So is, is there is no parliament? If there is no independence in the judiciary system, if if human rights are violated systematically, so what what's the system we've got? How how well, how should it be called? So even though there's no democracy in the regime, democracy is more alive than ever because it's alive in us, in citizens. And citizens that are the decided to respect the Constitution. And the Venezuelan Constitution gives us several means through which we can solve a political crisis such as this. That has no precedent. That has no precedent. And one of those means or tools is a recall referendum, but there are others. There's a National Constitutional Assembly, and there's the call for the resignation of, uh, of the president, which is as democratic and as constitutional as the others. And in order for any of them to take place, we require certain organization and, 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 and pressure through citizen peaceful and, and civic mobilization. And that's what we are fighting and, and moving along. Of course, as several obstacles, and, and you will see, and, and we can see how the government, uh, unprecedented repression in these hours, I believe it's a consequence that they realize that this movement is growing. Mm -hmm. The fact that you don't see more people in the street doesn't mean that we are not moving ahead. People are scared, certainly, and are protecting themselves, but are getting more and more organized every day. Thank you. I just um, we'll change the topic just a bit. As everybody knows here, we did just freshly get my Helena off of, directly from her visits in Ottawa. And I was wondering if you could tell us what you were hoping to accomplish in Ottawa and what you think you did accomplish in Ottawa. Look, Canada. It has um, a very special, I would say, unique position in, in the hemisphere. 
Um, this country is an uh, uh, ethical uh, reference. And because of the, the strength of, of its um, institution, your institutions, but also the, the coherence and the courage in which the country has behaved regarding democracy, its values, and human rights. And uh, we've seen in the last uh, years, and more specifically in the last month, how um, this country, both at the parliament and the executive, have made clear positions how uh, the, their uh, support to human rights is, is firm. So it was very important uh, to, to, to come first to, to recognize and, and, and on behalf of Venezuelans also thank because we, we, we felt quite abandoned by many others during these uh, moments. Second, uh, uh, even though I, 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 I found that uh, they are worried and concerned and informed, uh, the degree and the, the, you know, the quantity of things that are taking place in Venezuela is huge. So these uh, members of parliament and senators not necessarily have the time to be updated. So it was very important to, to make it clear how things are escalating and, uh, and, and discuss uh, actions that could take place in order to increase political cost uh, for the government of Venezuela to, to, to keep moving on in terms of political persecution and, and repression. So several uh, possibilities um, were, were discussed. And one of them is, is, is that um, Members of the, of the parliament might uh, visit our country. I think that's something that is very useful. Very useful. We we, we organized in the last uh, month visit from members of the parliament of Peru and members of the parliament from Chile. And, and let me tell you, they what they saw, what they did. Even though there were people that were concerned and following up, was totally different from the the whole idea they they had. And today they are you know the main champions we have. In, those parts. So I think that's something that we, we keep on doing. And just a final question then is playing off of that. Do you see movement then? In other words, what happened at the OAS where it was difficult <coughs> to get a bit of majority support to have an open dialogue? Do you see some of those countries moving to become greater advocates for the position that you're advocating or favoring the opposition? And as this goes further out, do you feel more of those countries will come on to your side? And if so, what will what will take to get some of these countries to say, wait a minute, we better rethink our policy towards what's going on in Venezuela? Well, that, that's uh, you know, I don't have a straight answer to that because it's very complex. Because I would say that there, are, every country has different reasons uh, to to have certain positions. Some have to do with economic reasons in our countries that today uh, the oil that comes from Venezuela is uh, is a, a very important. Uh, part of, of their whole income. So there's a dependence there that, that was designed in order to have precisely that kind of loyalty. And, and it's very sad for us because when you, when you realize that El Pacto de San Jose, which was an initiative of Venezuela and Mexico, uh, did care, did care at that time for countries in both Central America and the Caribbean that, that, uh, that needed support from oil producing rich, rich, uh, oil rich countries in, in the region. Never a Venezuelan government dared to have in exchange a political um, loyalty or reaction, never. It, it, what thought it was a humiliation to, to any of those nations. Now it is clear that it's been used in that sense. On the other hand, there are countries that share the ideological views of the of the regime in Venezuela, and, and we see how they are moving in the same direction. Uh, those will be different, difficult to, to to change their position. And finally, I think there are countries that uh, prefer not to get involved in in, in in certain discussions, and perhaps think that they will they could be better if they don't take positions. But we are seeing how things change, and I will mention the case of Peru. Uh, I, I, I was surprised, positively surprised, and I've, I've been surprised in the last uh, month of how its disposition has been changing. I believe it's been changing because of the people of Peru. Because 94% of the people of Peru reject 
the regime in Venezuela. So, you know, that government better listen to the people. Mm -hmm. And they have elections soon. So I think that one of the, the, the strategies we should move along is talk to the people. Because the people of Latin America support our cause. And that's why every single Venezuelan around the world are today or, you know, main forces in order also to make uh, that circumstances change at the OAS. And I believe the OAS is an institution that should be saved. It's, it, some people feel it's, it's a lost cause at this time because of the pathetic and tragic uh, acts that it has a track record of the last uh, years. But, uh, but I believe the, the system, the inter-American system of human rights, is something that should be saved and strengthened by all of us. Thank you. We'll open it up to, I see there's going to be more than one hand, but uh, sure. So thank you. Uh, in 2010, I had the opportunity to be an international observer representing Canada, members of labor, ecumenical organizations, and the parliamentary Venezuelan elections. So I was a bit surprised to hear you say there's no democracy in Venezuela, only because myself, along with about 100 other uh, international observers from Canada, from the European Union, the organization, of America, the organization of American states, were very pleased with what we saw in terms of an electoral process, in terms of transparency. And of course, as you know, the last 19 you know, uh, electoral processes, whether it be recall referendums, the PSUV as one. So I was a little surprised to hear you. And then I read, I guess here, that you were running for presidential candidate. It sounds like an oxymoron. You would run for an electoral system, which you call anti-democratic. My first question. Mm -hmm. So if you could just maybe help me explain why you would run as a political candidate in a system, which you call you know, anti-democratic. I find that you know personally absurd when I've seen the electoral process in, you know, in Venezuela with my, with my own eyes. And second, in 2002, you signed the Carmona Decree, which in essence was the coup d'etat that overthrew the government of, of uh, Hugo Chavez. And yet, you know, in, in Canada, you would be considered a turncoat, which means you probably could be charged with treason. In Latin America, they'd call you Avenda Patria. How do you answer to that? How could you possibly sign a decree uh, that would overthrow your government unconstitutional? Uh, if I could just step in for one second. Um, you mentioned that the OAS uh, uh, observing the elections in 2010. I think it's been a number of years since the, the, elections, since yeah. the Venezuelan government has invited the OAS to observe the elections. They have not wanted to have the OAS observe the elections. And they have come under criticism for that. So I think you're, you're, from a going in proposition, your premise that the OAS observed it and and I should have met people that, from the OAS who were there. Yeah, but there was not an official. There was no. not maybe not. That could be not official. No, I think it's important no. distinction no. because I, I, I yeah. don't want to miss the polemic. But I think it's, I think we also have to be fair about the facts. Sure. The fact of the matter is the Venezuelan government has purposely not invited the OAS, which has the most systematic uh, uh, methodology. Actually, Carter is a let me I'll finish this. That has the most systematic systematic methodology. Observing elections, and they have not done it for the last number of times. So, so it was not; it did not have the blessing of the OAS. Okay, just well, take it, but just to correct you, it's not the OAS; it's the Carter Institute. Oh. It has the most systematic oh. method okay. of electoral oh. process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. 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 Well, well, just, okay. okay. Yeah, we can have discussions about that. But I'm just curious to the point. That's fair. I was just I was responding yeah. to your invoking the OAS, which was factually correct. May I ask your name, please? It's Raúl. Raúl what? Raúl Burbano. I work with them. Political think tank here in Canada? Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, uh, regarding the last point, I, I will uh, insist on what I have said several times. I did not sign uh, that, that decree. The government knows that. And uh, uh, actually, the fiscal who was investigated the, the process, uh, uh, that case, Danilo Anderson, also knew it uh, before he was killed. Second. Regarding the elections, imagine an election for parliament in which beyond all obstacles, uh, one party gets 52% of the votes and then turns into 40% of the seats. 52% of the votes, 40% of the seats. Uh, that was the way it was designed in order to uh, annulate the possibility that a majority of the opposition would uh, take the, the what it was its rights, our rights, and in the in the in the in the national assembly, and certainly I participated in that elections. And a pesar, how do you say a pesar? Despite, 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 despite uh, all those obstacles, 
we we achieve uh, we achieve a majority. Um, in in Minnesota elections, not only half of the population feel that election that the vote is not secret. Almost mm. half of the population believe the vote is not secret. You have to put your fingerprints in a machine that is connected to a voting machine, even if it's proved that it is secret. It's perception of what's critical at that point. Because public employees in Venezuela are terrified. Terrified. If, if, if Raul, if you had the chance to come with me and travel around Venezuela, I, I would certainly like to do that. So you could see and hear how public employees come up to me and cry. Especially in the bathrooms. I say I have my, my best <laughs> meetings in, in, in ladies' rooms. Because that's where they, they join in and they start telling me their stories and, and cry because they feel, as one told me uh, when I was going to Brazil last month, I was getting to a plane, he brought me and he said, this is a young engineer from Corpo Leg. He said, Venezuela, you, you have to understand, we public employees are political prisoners. <laughs> it broke my heart. When you live in a country where an ambassador doesn't dare to meet me publicly. An ambassador. What can you expect from a public employee? So that's the kind of fear we, we are we are living in a country. And just want to say one last thing. A regime can come into power through clean, fair, and free elections with a wide majority of the votes and then stop being democratic. The legimi legitimacy of a democratic system comes not only of how would you reach power, but how you exercise it. And what we're seeing in our country is that every single main element of democracy is being violated. The opposition as Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Because no matter how fierce mm -hmm. the political um, the differences, there's not one member of parliament who, who, who would uh, who is not loyal to the institutions that govern this country. And that you would attempt to represent the government of Panama in the Organization of American mm. States wow. uh, shows it is an example of your lack of loyalty to the Constitution of the So the question is, yes. the qu I'll have to answer the question okay. now or we'll have to go on. You talk about democracy. How can you uh, say this when the uh, Article uh, 191 of the Constitution definitely says that a parliamentarian can't do that in Canada? Uh, this was so the, the question is whether or not she should have accepted the the uh, commission from the government. Your second question is actually I already had answered. No, you did Because didn't. it was <laughs> answered by uh, Dr. Frankel. Uh, and uh, let me tell you something. When I went to the OAS, many people warned me of the consequences. Many people told me that this time I was not going to be forgiven. And uh, that I better just let it pass. That uh, the world will know one way or another what was taking place in Venezuela. But I not only read the Constitution. I remember what Geraldine's mom told me when I went to her, to the hospital where her daughter was dying. And I also went back the day where she was buried. And she made me swear and promise that her daughter's death was not going to be forgotten and that it was going to be in her memory that we would keep on fighting. So I decided to go and I decided to invite Geraldine's mom to come with me as well as a new leader who, has been, who is currently persecuted because he, he <coughs> denounced the tragedy of Amwai in the refinery of Amwai. And, and also one of the student leaders, Carlos Vargas. And, and we were invited to speak uh, in a process that has been taking place several times at the OAS. I was invited by the permanent council to speak as the Venezuelan member of the parliament. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many countries voted against that right to speak. 
Canada was one of the few that voted in favor of the voices of Venezuela being heard. <coughs> so at that time, I had two choices. To speak down, to lower my voice, to decide yeah, to go back. I'm just really annoyed by this person filming. And this is the state of things that there are for Venezuela living in Okay, Canada. let me finish. And yes, we don't know. I, I don't want to. We don't want to be no, Let me do it. I mean, it's not, no, you know what? I want every single yes, yes, citizen yes. in the world here <laughs> because it's tough for us and it has been very painful. But uh, I, 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 I sat in Panama's chair just as Venezuela offered its chair in nine, 2009 to the uh, former Zelaya's um, um, uh, foreign minister. And she spoke in Venezuela's chair. Exactly the same procedure uh, in the in the permanent council, yeah. and uh, it's, it's actually the secretary general, um, Sulsa, sent a letter to uh, Mr. Aveledo, La Mesa de la Unidad, saying that I spoke as a member of the Venezuelan Parliament using a procedure that has been used several times in the past at the OAS, so the world uh, can hear the voices of the people. I am very proud, yeah. and you know what? Even having been accused of treason, even having gone through all these threats to me and my family, I would do it exactly again. Yes. Because it is my right. I would like to ask no to Maria Corina, but to the doctor. Doctor, how do you no, speak no, in ma Parliament ma ma since they beat you up? Question, I'm question, I'm the question, the question, the question, the question. Okay, do you have a question for, for Maria Corina, please? Hi, Maria Corina. I am a Venezuelan. My name is Mario, and I've been here 23 years. And um, my question is where we are going from now in regarding the opposition. We have concerns because I think that the strength of the government and they have been come so far in uh, politics and in Venezuela is because we have a, a witnesses and they know and it's an opposition. So I want to know what's, I don't know if you can say it, I don't know if you've been politically corrected, but that concerns me because, uh, for example, that this person is talking about the, the way the opposition talks here and the way the respect, well, that Canada, I've been here 23 years, I don't know that Canada. I have seen people in Parliament fighting and, and insulting, <coughs> and I have seen that. We, we have a channel, we can see it in television. We have here uh, politicians insulting, one that is in drugs, one, you just bring the globe of mail and you will see. So that fantasy, I, I would like to be in that country, but I don't know that country. If one day you can invite me, I would love to see your side of the world. I've been here 23 years. I came very young. Everywhere, so but I want to know where we are standing regarding opposition. It's very important. I haven't been able to go to my country, I was also born there for five years. My dad is terrified that somebody can take my kids because they are different, they don't speak the language, they speak French, they are Canadians, they speak French and English. And, uh, and I haven't been able to go back in five years, and that I'm longing, longing inside me to go on see my family and see my country. And you will. So I just want to hear about the opposition. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's not easy to come together so many different uh, organizations and political groups that have, as, as you all are aware, different ideas uh, regarding policies. But we all share democratic values. And I think that's something that we need to evaluate and consider. Uh, and certainly at this time there are differences. I, I, I am the one, one of the ones that believe that uh, it is a, it's an, um, a sign of, a signal of, of, of maturity to be able to express differences uh, in a respectful way. And you, will, you, have, you have not heard from me and will not hear from me one word uh, against one of the members of, of the opposition. 
and, and the difference we have, we discuss them uh, privately, uh, passionately, uh, uh, but and then we can show and, and share with the, with the citizens different paths or strategies in which to advance. Because I believe citizens have done so much, have invested so much, have risked so much, that we need to listen also what the, what the people believe should be the path ahead. I believe we need to, to move along a democratic transition as soon as possible because the destruction of the government, uh, of the country is accelerating. Mm -hmm. and, but we should do that using the means that are in our constitution. But the students don't want to know about opposition. The students don't want to know about political parties. Well, I, that's, not what I feel when I, that's not what I feel when I meet no. with the students. On the contrary, <coughs> the day I was, uh, I was denied access to the National Assembly, there were thousands of students in the streets with me, as well as my colleagues, members of the party. So they have the right also to have their differences from 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 us politicians, mm -hmm. and 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 they have the right to say, well, we want to have this rally, and we don't have politicians today. Oh, well, that's perfect. But certainly, it is clear for us that if we stay divided in sectors, we won't be able to move ahead. And and student leaders have that very very clear. We have time for for two. So we have we have you've been very very patient. And then I think yours was, your hand went up, and so we did it get two more. Two more. So, uh, two more, those two, and then I think we'll, we'll have to, uh, <laughs> and everybody's going to say, please, I only have half of a question, it'll take a shot. Quarter of a question. But my queen Asa has another event after this, and she stayed, and obviously she wants to, she felt bad about arriving late, which is completely out of her control. And that's why we've gone over a lot longer than we thought we would, and we'll go a little bit longer, but we also have to respect our other commitments. So if we close it with those two, uh, please, thank you. First two words, thank you. On behalf of many of us here, not necessarily all, but most of us here, thank you. And number two, what can we do? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what can we do from here? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that question also. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you read the other question and then? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, you stole my idea and I should have done it first. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your name? Patrick. Sorry, what's your name? Oh. Andrea. Oh, I, mine or his? Oh. Both. Patrick. 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 My name is Andrea. I also wanted to thank you. And because this is a matter of discussions, actually, I would be willing, if you're respectful enough, to ask a polite question. Or I, I okay. would, I would okay, that's, that's fine. Do you, do you have another question? But my question is, are we limiting ourselves by calling a position, and that's just responding to, to kind of her thing, are we limiting ourselves by calling each other opposition and chavistas? Mm -hmm. If we're really all here, it's because of these things that reads here, mm -hmm. and that's as well. So the students are fighting for that. It's not for whatever Maria Corina believes, or what Leopoldo believes, because they're not fighting for that. And it's, it's responsible enough, and that's really my question to you, Maria Corina. Is it enough to fall in the traps of limiting ourselves to labels of opposition and whatever that are just created by human people? The only reality is what you already addressed. We need organization. That's what we need to call each other something. That's if we want to conquer what really belongs yeah, to us. That, well, that's a good point. I think that this, as, uh, this time, we all realize that it has well, our fight has nothing to do with position in, in the left or right, and or opposition and officialism. At the end, it has to do with a society fighting and struggle for values, for human values, and and that's the, what seems so marvelous about this awakening that has taken place. You know, our students are not in the street asking for secta tickets or for que le aumenten el pasaje. You know, which were the reasons why. Uh, there were fighting and protesting last year. I mean, it has to do with, it's an existential uh, struggle. And that's why you see someone as Rebecca Gonzalez or Carmen Gonzalez. The first is the mother of Juan Manuel Carrasco. Uh, her son was tortured and, and he denounced he was violated. And the second, uh, Carmen Gonzalez, is the mother of Julio Arias. Her son was killed in in Itachi and Sakistoa. And and you know, I, I, I stood beside her days after Jimmy was killed. 
And then she was repeating what she said the day he died. Don't cry. No me den el pésame. Don't cry. Keep on fighting for the memory of my son. So it proves how deep we have committed ourselves and understand what's the, the, the nature of our, of our struggle, of our fight. So there's, Patrick, a lot that can, be, that can be done. First, I have to say that I'm impressed of the way Venezuelans are organized throughout the, throughout the world, and especially in this country. What I saw at the parliament is, is, is a job well done in terms of, of giving information and talking to many of the members of the parliament. That has to be continued and, and, and amplified. Second, we, we, I'm, I'm sure many people here in, in Canada uh, have doubts of what we're discussing because of lack of information. So, so the possibility to have these kind of sessions in which people that have other ideas or other views can be shared. We can uh, uh, show them the nature of our fight and, 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 and probably give them all the facts that they, they, they don't know. And uh, as I say, when, when a society is, sees that the institutional means are closed, totally closed, the institutional that, and the freedom of speech of information is being um, almost abolished, then you use, you, you have two choices. One, you accept to live every day with less and less freedom and dignity, or a society decides to speak out and, 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 and to fight for it. Uh, that's why the protest in the streets is um, indispensable. Indispensable. It's not enough, but it's indispensable. It has brought the eyes of the world to Venezuela, being civic and peaceful, but also we need to have those mobilizations abroad. So I would say we need to get better organized. There are ways in which and groups that are already doing that inside and abroad. There's a lot of information we can share with you, or you can also uh, share it with others. And, and certainly, we need to maintain progress in Venezuela and abroad. And we can't, we count on you to maintain and increase that process. Thank you so much. <laughs>